Today, I want to speak to you from Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. And the title of this message is this, no one else is coming. Tell your neighbor, no one else is coming. No one else is coming. Romans 10, verses 13, it says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Who bring glad tidings of good things. Tell your neighbor, those are some good-looking feet. Those are some good-looking feet. I don't have a feet fetish, but those are some good-looking feet right there. Amen. Amen. I believe that I believe that we, the church of Hermiston, we, the church of the 21st century, we, the church of 2021, are living in the greatest hour on planet Earth. We're living in the greatest time in God's economy. I hear, I read a headliner not too long ago. Uh, I'm big on YouTube. I like to listen to music and preaching all the time. And, and there was one option that popped up, and the title of it was this, Things are not falling apart. Things are falling into prophetic place. Amen? What you're seeing and what you're witnessing are the very things that Jesus promised would happen before his, his second return, before he's coming again, before he appears on the eastern skies. I was doing a funeral a few weeks ago, and, and I made a comment to that group that were there. I said, did you notice that all the headstones are facing east? Do you all know why that is? It's because Jesus is coming from the east, the Bible says, as he comes through the clouds. As the angel said in Acts chapter 1, as you have seen him taken up, so you will see him returning in like manner when he comes again to call his saints home. Amen? Uh, you know, even Paul, or Peter, I should say, in the book of Peter, there were those then that thought maybe Jesus had already come or that he was not going to come because they were prepared for him to come at any moment, any hour, even then, 2,000 years ago. But just because he hasn't come yet doesn't mean he's not coming. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, it says, but he is not slow concerning his promises, as some count as slowness or procrastination, but it's that he's not willing that even one person perish, that even one individual slip into eternity. And so every day that we have on this earth is another day to give a witness to who Jesus is. It's another moment, it's another opportunity, it's another chance to say, hey, have you, have, I, have you heard about Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Can I ask you a question? Do you wanna know him? And so talk about purpose. If you're looking for direction, if you're looking for God's will for your life, start with telling up someone about Jesus. Well, pastor, what is, my, what is God's will for my life? Tell somebody about Jesus. Well, what's his will for my life today? Go pray for the sick. What's his, life for, what, what's his will for my life today? Go raise up some dead person. What's his will for my life today? Go cleanse those that have diseases. Go pray over them. That is God's will for your life. It's not just to know, it's, it's, it's all about knowing him, but in knowing him, he has given us a great commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. And so we live in an hour that I believe, I believe that we've been handed, we're on the last lap of this track. We've been handed the baton and we are looking at the finish line. We're staring it down. We're in the last heat of, the, of this day and age of the church and we're about to cross the finish line. Amen? And the desired goal is that we cross it with as many people as possible. Because the only, the only thing you can take to heaven, you can't take your bank account, you can't take your 401c3, you can't take your retirement. All you can take are other souls, other people, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, your 
grandchildren, your family members, your friends, those are the only people that you can take with you. Amen? And so we live in the greatest hour. And, and this is why G, Paul said these words. He goes, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I looked in the Greek, and it says, whoever, and it translates whoever. <laughs> it means anybody, everybody. It doesn't matter what their social status are, what their background is, what their race is, where, where they come from, high income, low income, educated, non-educated. It doesn't matter where they come from. The word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's pretty that's pretty good odds. That's, pretty good, that's a pretty good reason to give invitations to those who don't know him, you know? And so I want to give you a few practical things when it comes to uh, sharing your faith. And then we're going to, go to, I mean, then I'm going to take you to one more passage before it's over. Because Paul here, he's saying, he says, listen, how shall they call on him and if whom they have not believed. How should they, they believe on him who they have not heard? Do you realize that still one-third, this is hard to wrap your heads around, my head around, one-third of the human population, I even, even when I talk to missionaries, we're going to have some missionaries coming up in November um, that we're going to be talking about, but even they tell me, they go to parts of the world where they say, Terry, one-third of the human population has not heard the name of Jesus. That's why we're so big on going. That's why we're so big on sending missionaries uh, to every remote place. In fact, Jesus even said he will go to the most remote place of the earth. And that's the goal of us as believers is that we carry out. We, it, it, we, it, it is a sin to sit on this good news. It is a disservice because every human being on planet Earth deserves the right to know Jesus. Every living human being that breathes the breath of life, whether it's the gas station attendant that you go to or the banker or the cashier or the coworker or the family member or the person living in your neighborhood, every individual deserves the right to hear what Jesus has done for them. That's why... When Jesus gave the one illustration about talents, he said to the one who did nothing, he says, you evil man, you evil person, you had such a good thing, you had such a good treasure, and you're not using it, you're not, exp you're not expending it. And so Paul says here, how are they even to know if they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How th shall they uh, preach unless they are sent there are those who will go to the remotest parts. of the, There may be people in this audience today that God will call you to the most remote places on this planet. He says, how can they preach unless they're sent? And so we see here, there's, there's what we call personal responsibility. Say that with me, personal responsibility. I want to give you four quick points here. Number one, we need to accept personal responsibility. We need to say, if I don't, who will? No one else is coming. No one else, you know, I don't see anybody else in my workplace that's a believer. You know, it's, it's, you know sometimes we can get discouraged with our workplaces and, and, the, and even the families that we're in because maybe you're the only or one of the few believers in your family or even at your workplace. And, and while you're there trying to earn a paycheck and just pay your bills, yet you have to look beyond your own troubles, look beyond uh, the, your own struggles per se and walk in victory like we talked about earlier and realize that it's bigger than me. It's not about me, but rather God has placed us all uniquely in that family or on that job or in that community or in that neighborhood for a reason. I'm not gonna tell you that all the days at Oso Clean were full of God's presence. And Becky knows this, of course. I'm not saying anything. But I look back and realize if it was but for one family, if it was but for one customer. I mean, there were days, honestly, we'd, Sherry and I had just come back from the Philippines, and so we were used to doing that kind of work. And then God told, spoke to our hearts and say, just plant yourself in the area, in the community, and serve the local pastor. And I had no idea what that would look like. And I remember when I went for an interview 
uh, with Scott and Becky that Scott says, hey, Terry, I need a one-year commitment if I'm going to hire you. And honestly, I took, it, it was a hard swallow. I was like, okay, God, I don't know, I don't know where we're going with this, but uh, okay, we'll, okay, Lord, you know. And one year turns to two, two starts turning into three, you know. And right at the beginning, they, they instructed me, they said, hey, Terry, a lot of preachers tend to be carpet cleaners, and, which I didn't know that. And, uh, he's, and they're very people-oriented. And I remember Scott would tell me, he's like, Terry, I don't want you out there preaching to people on the job now. Don't do that. I'm like, okay, sir, yes. And, uh, and, but about a year and a half later, I'm out, I'm out somewhere toward, Ec- or toward Hepner in Condon on one of those days. And I get this random call from Scott, and he said, hey, Terry, I just want to tell you, if anybody wants to bring up or ask you about Jesus, go ahead. And I'm like, really? Okay. He's like, that's all I have to say. Click. And, um, and when you know it, that day, I went out so far out past Ione to where they have to give me directions and say, well, when you see the tree, go south. I mean, that's how far out I was. I'm like, and I kept calling him every five or ten minutes. Have I come far enough yet? He goes, no, keep coming. <laughs> and he says, you know, and I'm, a, I'm, from a, I'm a city guy, city slicker, city boy, whatever. I don't know what it means by saying go south five miles, go north, northwest. I'm like, tell me, is that left or right? Is that straight ahead? But when they start giving you instructions in terms of when you see that one tree go south, I'm like, I'm lost. Just say right or left. What does that mean? You know. And sure enough, that day, I end up cleaning a house for a guy, and the whole time he's literally like five steps behind me just wandering around the house. His wife had left him. He was going through divorce. He was as lonely as lonely could be, and he needed to hear something that was giving him hope. Amen? You don't realize what God wants to do. You may think, wow, this is a hard place, a hard job maybe, and yet God has placed you there. You have to say, you know what, Terry? Get over yourself. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. Amen? And you need to say, you know what? I take personal responsibility today. God has placed me here uniquely for such a time as this, for such an hour as this. You could have been dropped into any part, any part, any place in human history, but he decided to say, you know what, Melissa, this is the time I'm going to put you here. Lisa, this is where I'm placing you. Carlos, Marty, this is where I'm placing you for such a time as this. And we need to acknowledge God's call in our life to say, okay, Lord, it's not about me. It's all about you. It's all about you. And then secondly, we need to build personal relationships You know what? People are not looking to argue or debate. They just want to be loved. They're just wanting someone to show them the genuine love of God. Maybe they don't know what that, maybe they don't understand it. Maybe they're like, what is this? Why do I feel this way when I'm around you? You you know, you seem at peace. There's a joy. There's there's something about you that, that I cannot describe. People just want to see Jesus. They want to be, they want to know that we're genuine. Because believe it or not, people, people are watching you. People know, once, it, once the cat's out of the bag, once they know you're a believer, you know, they're listening to what you're saying. They're listening to, they're watching what you're doing and how you act and react. And it doesn't mean that we have to walk in fear and be walking on eggshells, but rather, if you're, if you're in pursuit of Jesus, you don't need to worry about that. You just need to please him. Like Paul tells, the, tells employees in the book of uh, Colossians, we just finished that up this week on our 7 a.m. call, but he says to employees, he says, everything you do, do it as unto Christ. Employers, treat your employees as unto Christ. What does that mean, pastor? It could mean showing up to work on time. Hello? <laughs> Taking only the lunch break that they offer you. <laughs> in other words, being ethical. Uh, doing what's right, because that in itself is also a witness. But sometimes witnessing means you need to open your mouth and use words. You need to say, I'm a lover of Jesus. Do you want to know more about him? Do you want to know him as well? And then share your testimony. 
In other words, maybe take a moment. These are just some practical. Take a moment. Take a sheet of paper. Maybe this afternoon while we're thinking about it, take a sheet of paper and just begin to write down saying, this was my life like before Jesus. This is what it was then. And this is how I met Jesus. I hit the wall. I was about to commit suicide or I was about to just call it, over, call it done or I was about to give up on life and just close the blinds and lock the doors and say, don't anybody talk to me. You know, what, whatever that was that brought you to that place, because, what, because that day, while it may have been your worst day, it became your best day. While in that moment you were ready to just walk away from life itself or walk away from family or walk away from friends or walk away from a job, yet that worst day became your best day. Why? Because you had an encounter with Jesus. You got, you got to know him that day. And then what your life is like now, having known Jesus, that's what people want to know. That's what people want to hear. Is really what you do, is it really that different from the world? You know, if, what, if our lives are just like their lives, then we have nothing to offer. In fact, Moses in the Old Testament, he even said to God, he said, Lord, it is your presence, it is you that makes us different than everybody else. And he said, if you're not with us, I don't want to take another step. I don't want to go any further. And so take a moment, whether on your smartphone, on your note app or whatever, write down some thoughts. Think about what you would say if the opportunity availed itself. Even Jesus in the book of Matthew, he told the disciples, he said, don't fear in that hour when they drag you in front of a, front of a judge or when you have to give account publicly for your faith because in that very hour, I will give you the words to say. Amen? In other words, he will put, all you gotta do is take the risk and open your mouth. You might stumble, you might stutter, you might, you might be apprehensive at first, but God says here, take the risk, step out, tell me, tell them about me. And then, of course, give them that invitation, whether it's an invitation to come and hear the gospel here at church or an invitation to, on the spot, say, hey, I want to I know Jesus. I want to take you at the moment, and you may say, well, pastor, how do I get to that place? How do I, how do I take that risk? What's going to push me over? Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I was rereading this in the Passion Translation, and I just want to read a little bit, and, it, and then we'll take it to prayer this morning. But Acts chapter 1, this was just days. Uh, this, well, let me say it this way. This was days before Pentecost. This was about 10 days before Pentecost came. And Jesus had died and rose again and had been basically visiting people all around for a period of 40 days. Uh, the word says, in fact, in this chapter, it even says that he would appear and have encounters and he would teach them more truths about the kingdom and he would even share meals. Isn't it interesting? Even after his resurrection, he was still having dinner with people. He was still having meals with people and uh, sitting down with them. But the word says in Acts chapter 1, uh, I believe it's in verse, the end of, or starting in verse 4, it says, Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you receive the gift I told you about, the gift the Father has promised. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In other words, that honestly, believers, this is for all of us, we, God has, when I say that we're living in the greatest hour, and when I say that, 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 this is the greatest hour for the church and that what we're gonna see is awesome when it comes to harvest. Um, understand this, it is, we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it by our own wisdom. We cannot do it by our own ability, our abilities to talk or not talk or whatever. We cannot, you know, even the most eloquent of people cannot accomplish God's work without the presence of God. Amen? And he says here, you know, John baptized you in water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In other words, that it is his super on our natural. We call that supernatural. <laughs> when you step out, you're going to sense the supernatural power and pray. This is the thing. God meets you when you step out. I remember when I was young, I was still in college, and 
And uh, I joined this team where we'd go out every Friday night and hit, this was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Louisiana State University. They had what they call Chime Street. Chime Street was, is nothing but a row of bars. And we would go down every Friday night for months. And, uh, and we would experience God's presence as we stepped out. How many of you know the majority of miracles take place outside the four walls of a church? We think somehow that it's just what's happening in here is, is where all the action is taken. It's happening on your job. It's happening at your house. It's happening in your neighborhood. And I remember we'd go out there for months, and, 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 I was, and we were experiencing such wonderful things, just witnessing to other students our age but that, that went to LSU. And I remember one night I, I told the guys, I'm like, you know what, guys? I'm going to stay in tonight. And I stayed in. And then the next week, I'm like, hey, guys, I'm just taking a break, taking a sabbatical. I'm going to stay in. And this went on for about a month or two where I just took a break. And I remember one night, and, and, and I remember I was, something was different. Something was, there was something that I was not experiencing that I was experiencing before. And I remember one night I was just crying the blues, having a pity party in my dorm room by myself. And I remember I said, Lord, why am I not experiencing the intensity or the freedom of your presence like I was just a few months ago? And it was almost like God the Holy Spirit was waiting for me to ask the question. I mean, it was almost like he's like, come on, Terry, ask the question. Come on, it's in you. Ask me. I got the answer. And I remember immediately as I said those words, God, why? Immediately the voice of the Lord spoke to me and said, well, Terry, you're not out there using it. You're not out on the streets. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not taking the time. You're not taking any risks. You're not putting yourself in a position where you have to rely on me. You're not putting yourself in a place where you have to trust me to give you the words to say or show you insight and pray for the sick and lead people to Christ and demonstrate the love of God. That's why you're not feeling it right now, Terry. And I said, Lord, forgive me. God, forgive me. Help me that I would never do that again. But I'm telling you the word, we see here that verse, then you drop down, verse eight, he says, but I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power. Tell your neighbor, filled with power. You'll be filled with power and you will be my messengers. It actually means martyrs. In other words, it means you're willing to die for Jesus, die for the cause, die for. In other words, you will go to the greatest extent to see people come to Christ. Like the word says, there's no greater love than one who will lay his life down for another. That you're willing to, you're willing to, inter, you're willing to mediate, you're willing to uh, fight for them in the sense of sharing the good news with them as though your life depends on it. And in those days, oftentimes it did. It may mean that they lost their lives for Christ, lost their jobs, lost their family. The, many of them suffered for his name's sake. And yet these same people had the greatest joy, the greatest peace. Even the disciples, just a few scriptures earlier, the word says every time they got together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is it time now for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? In other words, all they had in mind was, when are you going to pounce on these Romans and get rid of them so we can be free? When are you going to take over? You know, you've done all this. Now, come on, let's get, let's get busy with taking over and getting all these Romans out of the way, this, ridding us of this oppressive government tyranny. But Jesus said, you know what, guys? It's not the time or the hour for you to focus on. But, he's, but he, he says, but I promise you this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be filled with power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth. What was Jesus saying? While we, according to the book of Thessalonians, while we have this hope that purifies, we have the hope that Jesus is coming again. Jesus even told him in Matthew, he says, listen, when I go away, I'm gonna prepare a house for you. If it were not so, I would tell you. In other words, he's preparing heaven for us. And that is a hope that should keep us encouraged, a hope that purifies. But he says, but, I, but, he says, but that's not the focus. The focus is the lost. The focus is Letting other people know what you know. 
sharing with them the good news that Jesus has come. He died, he was buried, he rose again for our salvation. And that we don't have to live in bondage any longer for one more moment, but that we can enjoy forgiveness and freedom in the spirit. Jesus, do you realize this, that while Jesus is eager to come and bring his family home, he doesn't even know when that time is? If Jesus is not all wrapped up with wondering when the time is, should we be focused on that? We know he's coming, and we can feel it in the air. We, we sense something is about to happen, and that is, that's what continues to encourage us. But in the same token, all Jesus knows is, I need to be busy about my father's business because souls are the reward of God. God sowed Jesus into the earth through the cross. He sacrificed his own son, and his reward is the salvation of the lost. And so when you participate in that, you're participating in his reward. His history, his story now becomes your story. You're now part of history, his story. Amen? But he says here, he says, don't leave Jerusalem. In other words, don't, don't keep going on. Don't. I, I think if there was not a day of Pentecost, which happened 10 days later, and this is a second gift to the gift to the, uh, to the gift of salvation, I believe that if that day had not taken place, the Great Commission would have been a great flop because we need his super on our natural. We need his presence in our life. We need his, not only his freedom from sin and forgiveness, but we need his empowerment to live this life, to live it in victory, to live it in power and to live it in authority, to take authority over disease, to take authority over, over the enemy's lies, to take authority over dreams that you ought not be having because you're a daughter or a son of God, amen? But also to have authority that when you speak, God is right there. He's like, hey, tell him this, tell him that. Have you ever had time to tell somebody about Jesus and then hours later in your mind, you're still rehearsing everything you said and woulda, shoulda, coulda said? What is that? That's the presence of God still talking through you, saying this is the good news. Amen? And so I want to encourage you today, take personal responsibility. Look at the lost. Be, look at building relationships. I, I believe that in the days that follow, you know, someone shared with me this dream not too long ago, but someone shared with me a dream about Hermiston that they were walking through Walmart and they saw huddles of people, three and four and five people in circles and the Hermiston store out in the parking lot as people were being prayed over, as people were being receiving Jesus and receiving miracles. And, and, and I believe that's a prophetic word for our church and for our community, that what is happening here is going to happen out there, that it's not about our church per se, it's about his kingdom, and that you might find yourself in Walmart or Safeway and in the ice cream section looking for a good vanilla ice cream, you know, and, uh, and God gives you a, a, a holy nudge and say, hey, talk to her, pray for her, something's wrong. She might look good, she might be dressed well, her hair all nice, but something on the inside is dying. She needs to know that Jesus loves her, amen? What is that? It's his super on our natural. I'm telling you this again, no one else is coming. If you don't, who will? But yet God does not leave us alone. He does not just throw us out and say, have at it and I hope you make it. But he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am right there with you. I am empowering you by my spirit. Amen. Praise God. Will you stand with me this morning?